Um, good evening. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's good to be here. My name is Adrian Jones. I am a Wingspace uh, member, uh, set designer, lighting designer, and I've also um, done a bit of pivoting myself uh, to some architectural lighting uh, in the recent few years. Uh, and I, um, I would ask the rest of our panelists to turn on their cameras. Um, we've got uh, a great panel of five guests. Um, and uh, before I introduce them, I'm just gonna talk, just, uh, just describe what we're, what we're here to do. We're talking about um, our work in the theater and how at certain points for many of us, that work has transitioned into other things. Um, sometimes those other things are on the side. Sometimes those other things are uh, become the main thing. Um, and, uh, and the theater profession, especially what we do, where many of us are, are, are jacks of many trades, and at least I have found it to be uh, a skill, a, a set of skills that have been, has been useful in many other fields. And, um, and so we wanted to talk about what that means for different people in different areas. Um, we are joined today by, uh, let's see, we'll start with Kate. Uh, Kate, the bios, everybody's bio is going to be posted in the chat. Um, and, uh, but in the, in, in the interest of brevity, I will give a, just a quick intro. Kate is a multimedia artist uh, for the theater, uh, doing projection design, uh, and has, um, and has recently been uh, working with, started a company called Remarkable Squirrel, um, doing uh, media production for non-theatrical projects. Um, Aaron Kopp uh, is a lighting designer um, for the theater and has also been working uh, in uh, production and events and consulting. Um, and uh, Lauren Halverson uh, is a dramaturg um, and has a, uh, a Substack uh, group, a newsletter um, called Nothing for the Group, um, which is uh, the number one theater newsletter on, stubs, on Substack, um, the best way to learn about American theater history. Um, and uh, Stowe Nelson, um, uh, New York-based sound designer uh, and noisemaker uh, for the theater and is currently working uh, for This American Life uh, as a production manager. And finally, uh, a new panelist who's just joined our panel, we're excited to have her, Janelle Robinson, is an actor, teaching artist, um, and uh, a performer who is also um, created a hot sauce uh, outside of the theater. And uh, we're eager to hear about that. So um, with those brief introductions, um, I will, uh, I think the thing that I would like the group to just start talking about and would be great to hear, um, and I will start with Kate. Um, tell us just a little bit about your background, how your work in theater transitioned, what brought you to a transition and where and, and where you've landed, what you've learned um, in that process. Just give us a little background. Yeah, um, I feel like my whole adult career has been about transitioning. Uh, I used to be an actor and then I was a production office coordinator in television. Uh, and the whole time I was working as a lighting designer on the side, decided I wanted to do that full time, applied to grad school, got in for projection design instead. And now I do mostly projection design, still a little bit of lighting design. <laughs> so many meandering paths. Um, but Remarkable Squirrel came out of the pandemic, really. Uh, it was a couple friends of mine from grad school. We sort of had a support group. We started meeting once a week on Zoom just to like have a support, some people to talk to about what it was like to not be doing anything all of a sudden and we started trying to you know fill our time and learn new skills and things like that and got some digital projects going and started doing them together as a group and realized that this might be a thing that we wanted to continue doing even once the pandemic was over you know have a way to set our own hours a little bit more be have the freedom to not take every show that comes our way and just give us a little bit more freedom Uh, did I fully answer the question? Thanks. Yes, that's great. 
Um, thank you. Um, let's see, Aaron, do you want to do you want to just introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi. Um, I I've been doing lighting design for a long time, and uh, I think like a lot of people here, I probably was taking every show that came my way and working like crazy. And I think one year I went 180 days without a day off and, you know, we've all done that and it sucks. And as I got older and I had children, um, I needed to be home and I needed to look to my future. I'm getting older and um, I don't want to be on the road all the time. And so um, kind of by happenstance, uh, my my wife became very active in the live event business and so her company would hire me to do lighting design for these crazy live events you know lighting a party in the chelsea passage tunnel of on the high line you know, you know doing stuff at the shed and uh it, it's not an interesting work because as a designer you can always get something out of it for yourself you can always make beauty whatever you're doing and, you know, we, we have certain rules about who we work for and who we won't work for. And so we <laughs> try to avoid uh, the worst of it. Um, and then the consulting sort of grew out of um, relationships with theaters that happen to be either renovating or building a new facility. And uh, those, those relationships are all straight from performing arts relationships and design relationships and, uh, you know, you work with one and they're building a building and they get you involved. And, you know, I'm, and I want to be clear, like I am in no, I am not a theater consultant. I am not one of the people at Auerbach or Fisher Dax. Basically I work as a consultant for the owners and as an owner's rep. And uh, so I essentially sit in meetings with theater consultants who really, really know their technical stuff, but who have not done a show in 30 years. So I'll look at what they're doing and kind of go through the thought experiment of, well, how would I do a show here? And realize, oh, the lighting positions are all in the wrong place. Or, wow, if I had to get equipment in, the loading dock is, you know, at street level through the lobby and there's a door that's 30 inches wide. So you can't load a show in, you know? So those relationships all, it wasn't something I sought necessarily, but once I started doing it, um, I realized I cared about it. I cared about making good theaters. And so I wanted to be involved in it. So I continued to do that. So, uh, but I'll always be a lighting designer. I'll always want to be a lighting designer and I'll always take the projects that I can afford to take. Thank you, Aaron. And I should, I should note um, this, uh, this salon uh, is, um, is partially uh, due to Aaron's prompting. Aaron said, why don't we do something to talk about sidelines and, uh, and, and pivots. Um, and, uh, so thank you, Aaron for, um, and I think that, that I'm sorry, I'm interrupting, but it, it came out of a sense that nobody talks about it and everyone does it and nobody talks about it. And that we ought to talk about it because I think that, uh, there's a lot of people who are getting into theater who should know about this or, you know, earlier mid-career people who should know that not only do not have to be ashamed of it, you can seek it and there's some things you can do to put yourself in a position to do it. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. I think that that's something I wanted to talk about was, was the, the constraints of family and finances and, and things that happen in life that, uh, that make um, theater tricky. Um, I'm gonna pass it to Lauren uh, to tell us a little bit about her theater work and her um, writing. Um, so I have always, my whole career, I've always been a staff dramaturg and an institutional literary manager at theaters. Um, I did that, I think, for like 13 years straight at like two different organizations and was, you know, burnt out, but happy to continue doing it. Um, and until the pandemic, um, I lost my, my position was eliminated in June 2020. And after that, I knew that my full-time job search was going to take me out of theater because everything was just comically bleak. I think every single, there was like the fellowship of the laid off dramaturgs. Um, I feel like I got phone calls from everybody because everybody was losing their jobs and we didn't know what to do. Um, and you know, I was, I wanted to still stay tethered to the world and to the work. And I was also very eager to have 
a writing project of my own just because I didn't really know what my own voice sounded like because I had been writing an institutional voice for a decade. Um, and I didn't know what I sounded like outside of the constraints of a style guide. So I ended up starting this newsletter that like was basically like a combination of like theater news and reviews and like commentary on like different like institutional messes and dramas. Um, just because it was, there was so much that was happening in the industry and I felt like nobody was really talking about it, particularly in, 20, in June, 2020, when you had all of these theaters who were radically um, restructuring their staffs, you had these calls for anti-racist action and you had a lot of theaters who were like deeply fumbling the messaging around it. And I was really interested to like have a space to talk about how theaters craft their like public narratives. Um, and, you know, I started this thinking that like maybe like a hundred people would read it, if that, like it never really seemed to me like it was going to be something that could ever generate a revenue stream for me. Um, but it's been a year and a half and I have a very substantial readership. And now it is actually like the amount of income that it generates because I offer paid subscriptions is like enough to, for it to be like a real part-time job that I now do in addition to my full-time nine to five outside of theater, um, which I work for an engineering company, which if you know me is kind of hilarious because I do words, I don't do numbers, I don't do math, but um, it's still like, so now I toggle between both of those worlds, but I'm still in it. So, so the, the other part-time job is not, is not theater either. No, my full-time job is not theater at all. Um, I work in accounting and operations in HR. It is deeply boring and great, but um, it is a, yeah, it's a lot of, it's a lot of meticulous Excel. Like I spend all day listening to nineties hip hop and like doing stuff with spreadsheets. It takes up 5% of my brain. It's, which gives me a lot of space to have the creative energy to actually like write and to do things that I never had previously when I was, you know, working like 60, 70 hour weeks at a theater. Right. Thank you. I'll pass to Janelle uh, to tell us a little bit about. So um, like everyone else who's spoken, I've been in theater for a really long time. I've been performing for forever from New York City. Um, and I've, in my adult life, probably when I was like 25, I split my time between acting and then youth work, youth theater work, and found that I just really loved it and found it was necessary for me to be in that space. And um, I feel that same way about being an entrepreneur. So I have a pepper sauce and um, <clears throat> soon I'm gonna have a jerk sauce and all of these other products that I'm working on right now. And when I got into that space, so that kind of developed organically for me because food was always kind of in my DNA. My mom was a cook. My parents are from the West Indies. Um, I always thought about ways that I could also generate more income, things that can grow. But when it started, it really was just out of the love for cooking. And actually I was performing, I was doing a show with the public and the director had me make the sauce on stage. And that's kind of what started the whole thing because uh, everyone in the audience ate it, they loved it. And a couple of years later during the pandemic, when I wasn't acting, I wasn't really doing much. I um, just had all of this time and found the resources and just sort of made it happen. So a year later, here I am. And um, it just allows me also to be really creative in so many different ways. I'm able to use um, all of the things that I love about acting. I'm able to perform. I do a lot of my own, all of my own promo and um if you go like on my website and on my IG, you see like little videos that I've shot and I write my own things. So it's it's definitely a great uh, vessel for me to be creative. And I think with everything, that is what I wanna be doing the most is just using my creativity to build things, create new things. So it's been really lovely. Thank you. And you also, you have a bit of a, uh, you've started other things before, right? You started a youth theater performance group in Port Washington. So yeah. You're, I you're, did. You're yeah. Right. Yeah. A few are, um, I guess it's, it's been a while now, but when I split my time between acting and, and working with kids, any opportunities that came my way, I kind of grabbed. And um, I guess that was one of the first 
things that I did as an adult where I was able to take something and, and build on it. And it's still going now, which is really exciting. Um, but yeah, same with everything that, um, everything else that I've done where I just like being creative and using that sort of skill set. Uh, just, and, and even just being a, an actor uh, where I have to self start and you're kind of a small fish in a big pond, it seems, or a big sea. And uh, you find ways to get what you want with what's kind of being given to you. And talk about pivot, there's a lot of pivoting <laughs> uh, that you have to do for that. But you find ways to, to do what you plan to do and watch it unfold. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, I'm going to pass to Stowe, uh, who has to tell us about his work. Um, yeah, so so my uh, last couple of years sort of started as looking for a, a sideline and turned into a pivot. Um, I was uh, freelance designing in New York, uh, mostly working on new and, and newish and devised work um, off Broadway and regionally, and felt a lot of the same pressures that that Aaron talked about the travel. The, the shows back to back to back stacked up next to each other. And so the thing I went out looking for, the thing I was trying to find um, was something, if hopefully audio production that I could do essentially that would fill up half my year. That was sort of the dream thing I was looking for. And that could have been a flexible job that would fit around theater projects. That could have been contract work that would have taken me out for a certain amount of time. I was kind of open to whatever all those things were. Um, and through another theater sound designer, Matt Tierney, who had previously taken a job at This American Life. Um, after lots of bugging him, I finally got him to let me freelance with them and um, pick up some slack when he uh, went out to go do a show. Um, and so I started just working for them um, here and there as a mixer and as just kind of a, an audio person to, to lend them a hand when they had something. Um, but trying to do that as a side hustle like really didn't, didn't work for them. Um, uh, I would work for them for three or four weeks because I had some free time, but then I would go off and do a show and I'd be unavailable for a month. And then uh, I wouldn't hear from them again for three months because I would just sort of get out of their cycle and they wouldn't need me for a while. So, um, so then there was an opportunity uh, with them to work on the third season of the, uh, the serial podcast. Um, and I got that job and was around for like four solid months working with them and, um, and mixing on the show. And uh, at the end of that, they offered me a full-time job. And so I sort of had to stare down this question of, well, I was looking for this temporary thing. And now, I'm, now I've been uh, given the opportunity to do this more permanent thing. And, and should I jump in? Um, and it helped to be coming off a, you know, a four-month experience at Serial, um, working on something I felt really creatively fulfilled by and passionate about. And, um, and really knowing what the, the, that institution was by that point, having spent a lot of time there. Um, and so I did, I took the job um, and I've been there since November, 2018. So a little over three years now. Um, my job is uh, mixing for the show, um, curating music and commissioning music for our library. And then as you would think, uh, since my title is production manager, helping to manage production and make sure everything runs smoothly when we're trying to make the show every week. Um, and it does feed some of the same things that, that being a theater designer did, there is that crunch to you know your it's four o'clock and you don't know what the final cue of the show should be and you have a preview at seven and you feel that that deadline pressure um that definitely exists in our kind of weekly show um discipline uh and you know getting to tell stories through audio is um is something i've done you know since i graduated from college and i think that i continue to do there um and i found a lot of the skills really transferable in thinking and and uh, the relationship to a director, the relationship to a playwright is not dissimilar to my relationship to, to the editorial leadership of This American Life. Um, so it's been, it's been, it's been a really great thing for me. Um, I, I, um, it's an exciting place to work and, um, and as a pivot, I can't imagine one that, that sort of worked out better. So it's been really nice. Thank you all. Um, just a little background for, for myself. I'll just describe where, I because I have had kind of a couple of pivots, um, a pivot and a sideline and maybe a pivot, um, which leads me to my next question as well. I was doing theater for a long time. My first pivot was after our second child was born and it became apparent that uh, my wife who writes for television, it wasn't, it wasn't possible for me to go away for any tech period. Uh, and she didn't know when she was coming home from work. So I 
stayed home with the kids for several years. And then, um, and luckily Wingspace came along and I was involved with Wingspace and I felt creatively active in Wingspace. But then um, as right before the pandemic in, in 2019, I got a call from an old friend who uh, happened to be a developer and needed some architectural lighting help on a big project in North Carolina. And, um, and I have been doing that steadily since, um, since then through the pandemic. Um, and thank goodness I had it through the pandemic. Um, and uh, so yeah, this is this pandemic is a is a common uh, thread, um, as as we talk about. Um, my next question is, uh, is kind of related to that. Um, and one that I'm asking myself a lot, because we my family, we, we watch Shark Tank with the kids. Um, and, uh, and one of the things uh, that I find kind of interesting on Shark Tank is whenever the, the sharks are kind of talking to somebody about their project or their idea, there's, um, there's often a point at which they say, are you all in? Are you, are you doing this? Are, do you have another job? Or are you doing this uh, part-time? Because if they're doing it part-time, the sharks are not interested. Um, and I always, I always kind of say, well, am I not enough of a, sh uh, am I, I don't know, I'm not a shark, but uh, am I, am I not, am I not, am I not in this enough? Um, and do I, at what point do I need to be all in? And so I guess um, I, I'm curious, you know, I mean, Stowe, you talked a little bit about, you know, your desire to have your production work on podcasts be a sideline or, or something for a while, and then it became a genuine pivot. Um, I, I, anybody can just jump in, but I, I'm kind of curious to talk about that process of kind of negotiating what, what, when does it become a, a, a full pivot and what, what point do you need to make that decision or have any of you felt the need? Kate, yeah. You. Um, I mean, I'll just say that this is a question that we as a company are really struggling with. Um, it started, it, the goal was definitely for it to be a sideline and maybe eventually a pivot. Um, you know, I should say, it came out of the pandemic, but it also came out of a lot of us thinking about our life and our lifestyles and everything that everyone else has said about being gone all the time. And I'm a woman in her late thirties. I don't yet have kids. I would like to someday. How the hell am I going to do that? Right. Um, and we're still figuring out how to, how to balance that. Like there's three of us running this company and we were sort of hoping that our busy times would, would, you know, when somebody else was busy, somebody else would be able to pick up the slack. Sorry, my weird hand. Um, but this fall, all of us were crazy busy for like five months straight. And so the company has sort of stalled right now. And we're just picking up the slack and starting to pitch projects again, excuse me, pitch projects again and try to make something happen. And so it felt like we had this momentum and sort of left it, let it fall because all of us were focused on our other thing and how we're going to continue to do that and figure out how to keep the company moving forward where we haven't totally answered that for ourselves yet. Yeah, I think that's one of the things, right? When the schedule, we, we often think with theater, we can just juggle around everything, but sometimes uh, you just can't. Um, I, one of the things that uh, I always, you know, anybody, anybody else can jump in, but uh, one of the things I always, you know, when, when I was in graduate school, I remember, um, you know, thinking about, oh, what, what could I do in addition to theater? And I remember uh, there was one set designer, Santa Lacosta, who, who had always had done, um, done a lot of theater and, and had was doing film. And I always wondered how, you know, he's just a lucky guy. He gets to do both. And there are only a handful of people that I've known in my career who have been able to do one, both, you know, to, to, a, to a large degree. Um, I mean, the schedule is part of, sometimes it's just a schedule thing, right? Sometimes uh, a film schedule does not, does not, is not compatible with the theater schedule. Um, and Lauren, you, you have, you have so totally different uh, batch of, of schedule constraints. Um. Yeah, I mean, I it doesn't feel like revolutionary to be in my mid thirties and be like, wow, nine to fives are great. But like, I never had one and it's really amazing. Like the idea that an email comes in at 4.58 and I can be like, you know what? I'm not dealing with that until tomorrow. That like, I'm not expected. Like, I just, I did not realize like how much 
theater had um, sort of like warped my sense of professional and personal boundaries in that like my work just permeated everything. And there was never a moment when I wasn't available, when I didn't have to pick up the phone, when I wasn't answering emails at 10 PM. And that just left me to feel so incredibly exhausted all the time. And, and I just, I didn't have really have a sense of that overall tiredness of how that permeated everything, that the idea of going back to a full-time theater gig now just feels like incomprehensible to me. Um, and it's actually something that I write a lot about um, because I just think that I don't think that the theater industry is really built for any kind of sustainability. And that I think that it really profits off of this like young enthusiasm and of like exploiting that energy. But like once you get to a certain point in your career, like I, like I said, I'm in my mid thirties and there are certain things that I want that just like, you know, this industry is built for like single people with no dependents and like some sort of independent wealth. Um, and when I especially see all of these theaters making these big promises about like building a diver diverse workforce, I'm like, well, you're not paying people what they need in order to like actually achieve that. Um, when you're posting jobs for like, you know, in DC, a job for like $38,000 a year, it's just like, you're really limiting the type of people that can apply for that job. Um, Cause there aren't many people who can live on that, you know, on that sort of salary. So it is something that I've been thinking about, but also something that I personally have been struggling with is that you know, the comfort of a nine to five means that it also keeps me from accepting a lot of work that I think like personally, like devalues my, like my expertise and like wants to underpay me. But because of that, I haven't been in a rehearsal room in two years. And one of the things that I really miss is like working directly with artists, but also, you know, I got offered a 29 hour workshop and they wanted to pay me a $250 stipend. And I was like, no, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing that. Um, and you should be embarrassed to ask me that. You're like a Lord D theater. Um, were they so shocked just, that you said no? No, I don't think they were. No. I was actually kind of surprised. Like, you know, every week in the newsletter, I actually like post jobs that are below the living wage and juxtapose it with like the cost of living for the area or for the median. So I'm like, the fact that you're coming to me with this offer, just like, it feels like there's a real like, disconnect here but um did you tell yeah. them you were turning it down because it was too little money I did but also I mean it was the literary manager who was offering it to me so it's also like I know that he knows that it's terrible he's powerless to change anything about it the people who can don't care so it's just so you know it's just like this system that just sort of like feeds in on itself um so like me sort of like going off on him like wouldn't have done anything um but yeah. yeah. So it's, I think for me, it's just like, am I ever going to get to a point where I feel like I can pursue that like direct creative work again? Or is it just like not a financial possibility for me anymore? It's something that I'm like really struggling with as I sort of figure out like the balance between full-time and pivot and sideline and et cetera. Yeah, Janelle. So all of these questions I've been asking myself before the pandemic, I think the pandemic made me, forced me to really, um, really examine them these questions in depth because i also experienced burnt burnout like everybody else here because we've all been working on the same schedules like you know we've all worked the same hours and it was just kind of non-stop and so you love what you do but you're so exhausted and i was thinking about that too like wh what is my future going to look like if i'm feeling this way and i'm you know 31 32 i'm 33 now uh but that's kind of how uh I mean, entrepreneurship, I think the cool thing about that, and really in a way we're, we're all entrepreneurs because we're putting ourselves out there, we're championing ourselves, but you can make your own rules. And for me personally, I, my personality is, has always been that I've had so many different interests and I didn't ever want to limit myself to just one thing. I think naturally, if you're working in a field, that is the thing that you do. But um, I've, I just have so many, there are so many things that stimulate me. And so that kind of crosses over to my life now. Like what rules can I make for myself? If I want to do multiple things, I can. And, if, you know, it's, I think it's a personal thing of figuring out what works for you and what doesn't. Boundaries has been a big thing as well. Even before the pandemic, you know, um, <clears throat> how late is too late to receive an email and send it? Is it really okay to wait until the next day to send an email or to finish the thing? Actually, I find myself doing 
the things that I found to be really toxic. And with performing and acting, I kind of do the opposite. Like I give myself grace with all of those things. I give myself grace to fail. Um, and it's okay if something doesn't go as planned or um, I think that is like a pivot in itself in a way. Yeah, there's something liberating, right? When uh, when you've let go of something, you can let go of other things maybe a little bit too. Um, yeah, it's a big mental shift. Yeah. That I think a lot of us went through in the pandemic to, to finally have the space to like be home with our partners and our families and have some time off. It was like revolutionary <laughs> in a way that it shouldn't be. Um, and it, I think a lot of people realize, started to realize how toxic the expectations of constantly being available and the super long hours and all that stuff. Like it's things you always complained about and knew, but also were, people wore like a badge of honor. And I think we've started to realize how toxic that that is. And Hopefully that continues to grow and things like no more 10 out of 12s continue to grow and make some headway. Um, I'm super excited the next Broadway show I'm working, we're putting up Beetlejuice again and we have no 10 out of 12s and we have two day weekends. Wow. And I mean, it's a, it's a remount, so it's a little bit different, but still super excited about it. <laughs> Yeah, Windspace has done several uh, uh, salons about 10 out of 12s, both 10 out of 12s and uh, living wages in the theater. If anybody wants to, a little plug for our uh, YouTube video library, which our uh, salons team got online. If you want to check any of those out, um, there's a good batch of salons all about those things. Um, I was going to so yeah, no, go ahead. Build off Kate's point and just say, as a person who who's taken a step out, and I'm and I'm not as far away from the culture of, of being always on as as Lauren is in her new job. Like it, it mine is still a shop where I do get emails at ten o'clock at night, and it's not um, expected that you respond. But my Slack is active all the time, and I'm I'm definitely plugged in most days and most evenings. But the weekends are incredibly valuable, and I've always thought when we think about the ways we want to shape theater, I do think ten, changing ten out of twelves can be very important. Um, is very important, but I wonder if we don't talk enough about two day weeks. Like I just, uh, to Aaron's point about working 180 days in a row, I do think for a lot of designers, especially lighting and sound designers, it's going because of the nature of our work and because so much of it happens in the tech room, you're going to end up with projects that are sort of butting up against each other and adjacent. But if inside of those windows where you're working, there are opportunities for you to have a life and a breath and a little bit of space for yourself, you know, for me, when I look back at what my career was, having working five days and being off two days would have changed a lot about how I felt in those in those years where I was doing 20 and 22 and 23 shows a year. Yeah, I, I used to work in television and a 60 to 80 hour, like a 60 hour week was minimum and 80 to 100 hour a week happened on a regular basis. But I almost always had Saturday and Sunday off. So I had a life. And like, only having one day off doesn't give you enough time to have a life. You like go to the grocery store and do your laundry and start it all over again. I, I like this concept of French hours, which they talk about on film sets. Basically, you work a straight 10. If you're hungry, go get a sandwich. You're never more than 10 feet from a sandwich on a film set anyway. And, you know, after 10 hours, you go home. So you work like eight to six and no one's doing good work after that point anyway. Um, I like that. I, I was going to say I teched a show last week uh, that was on a 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. schedule. Um, and the director was from Holland. She's a, an opera director. And, you know, she was insane about it. She's like, oh, my God, how can we get anything done in the schedule? You know, we should be working. And she, she actually, the first night there, she suggested that she and I stay all night in the theater and light. And I, I said, no. I'm not going to do it. And there was a little bit of a discussion. She backed off, but I didn't want to. I mean, I made the argument that uh, we'd be lighting on a bare stage. and We wouldn't have people there. And what was the point? Uh, but eventually I just said, actually, I'm just not going to do it. And everyone backed off. But it was this crazy moment of like, 
wait a second, we're doing something that's really sensible here and you're trying to blow it up and make it not be sensible. But the nine to seven thing was great. It was amazing. Um, unfortunately, not a very well paid project, but still, you know, there, there are projects that are not well paid where you work an 80 hour week. And then there are projects that are not well paid where the hours are sane. So. Right. I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting was interesting about the pandemic was was that it made a lot of people realize things about their careers that I think working parents had been dealing with for a long time prior to that. Uh, and working moms in particular uh, really getting hit hard by a lot of that. Um, and now we're kind of in the situation where everybody is taking stock. Um, so. Uh, one of the things I wanted to, I just a, just a quick question for, for just to get back to your pivots um, and uh, what just to go around, what was your um, either biggest surprise or biggest learning curve um, as you kind of jumped into something else? What was what what either blindsided you or what was the thing that you felt like you had to really play catch up on um, at some point as you as you maneuvered into another um, another thing, um, I'll, 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 I'll go first and just say that one of the things that I discovered um, very quickly was uh, I had a whole batch of software. Everybody was, everybody I was working with had a new batch of software and I had to, I had to kind of uh, learn new software. Um, but, uh, but that was a purely technical thing. And, and also just the, the nature of the schedule was so different. We were building something that took, uh, years to, to make as opposed to uh, a couple of weeks. Um, and that was, those were big surprises, but I'm just curious what kinds of things popped out at you and how did you tackle them? Oh, yeah, Kate, yeah. go ahead, Kate. You can go. I was just gonna say the pace is surprising because, uh, you know, working on consulting anyway, uh, things things happen on a building construction pace, and yet I also found that you couldn't leave it alone for too long because there are people at the architect's office and the consultant's office who are working on that project all the time. So if you take ten days off or two weeks off to go do a show, when you come back, they may not have you know done revolutionary work overnight. But it's like okay, I missed ten days and a lot has happened and I have to catch up. So it's not you know, you're not dealing with this immediate deadline of my plot is due tomorrow and, but it's doable. I'm just going to stay up till two in the morning and I'm going to finish it. It's that world doesn't work that way. Uh, but I, and I think the, the degree to which a building is just way more complicated than a show. Uh, I did not appreciate. And Adrian, I know you've dealt with this too in architectural lighting that, you know, the, 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 um, the sheer amount of information that you have to absorb about a building is, is insane. And you can't just pop in on it once in a while. And I made that mistake of trying to just like check in every once in a while. And I wasn't absorbing enough information because there's 200 plates of drafting, uh, electrical risers and all of the stuff that is not my native language as a designer. And there's a logic to it and you can follow it and you can figure it out, but you have to spend a lot of time there with a red pen to kind of get your mind around it. And uh, so the complexity of the projects was surprising. Um, I, I was gonna say pitching new work. Um, I, it's something I never really had to do as a designer. I mean. You do, but usually you're already sort of in the room and you already kind of know, like someone has recommended you to somebody because like that's how the work keeps rolling, right? Whereas pivoting to something that we didn't have really any connections in, um, it started with a music video that was like a, a theater connection, a woman who was a theater singer, who's now like a YouTube star. She wanted the animated music video, so we did that. And then we did a series of videos for the Kennedy Center. And then after that, we were like, oh, we have to find people to reach out to. We have to figure out what we want to do and figure out who does it and just cold email people. 
and it's very scary. And I had no idea what to say in those emails and, and the idea of like pitching and marketing and sending a hundred emails to hear back from three companies and maybe you'll pitch to one is like really intimidating. So that's something st we're still working on. Yeah, Lord. Um, I, I was really surprised at how people assume that just because you write and publish something online that you are a journalist. Um, and I think that maybe because I live in DC, so I'm like surrounded by, it's like nothing but journalism lawyers um, <laughs> in my world. But, um, you know, it's something that I know that I do not have the skill. <laughs> like, it's like a very specific and very meticulous skill set that I personally do not have. And I think because I do so much writing about like toxic workplaces and just like problems in general with institutional culture, I have a lot of people who email me and say, here is this horrible thing that is happening to me at this institution, or here is like the various ways in which like I'm suffering different workplace abuses. Can you investigate this? And I have to say, like, I am not qualified to do any sort of like straight out and out reporting, but because I'm a dramaturg, I can like connect you with resources. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, that's the thing that I can do is I can at least like help connect you with the right people to do it. But I've had to establish like very clear boundaries around that, which I thought was like, which I found very surprising that I had to do that. Um, this is a very level one having a having a real job thing, but it really I remember the day that it really surprised me uh, that I was standing in the hallway watching two people have a conversation and they walked away from each other and I thought, wow, those two people just don't like each other. And I thought, oh, and they just won't like each other until one of them leaves or one of them dies. Like, that's it. They're just not going to like each other at this job. And that was so foreign to me because you know, we, you work on shows and you're around, a, you're around people for two weeks or three weeks or a month or however long, and then you go your separate ways. And if it doesn't work out, you don't work together again. And just that feeling of like, cool, that's a dynamic that is just going to be present in our work together for the entirety of the time that we work at this place um, was truly like really a very dumb thing to, to realize, but a thing that I, I definitely is very different than, than working in the theater world, I felt like. Sounds like a university theater department. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sounds like I mean, actually working on like the administrative staff of the theater, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. There, there is so much about freelancing that's liberating. And, and it, the, this whole thing, this whole reason we're having this conversation, uh, you know, really at, at its root, it's about um, money and it's about creativity. And I think frequently people get into theater to, find a creative impulse, creative outlet for their impulses and they they can't find it because as a lighting designer you you end up working as an electrician and or you end up uh, as a programmer and you you don't end up doing the thing that you like to do and uh so you need to find something else to be creative with and i think also this this gets to this whole discussion about the change that we want to see in the theater world um if everyone is is a, is a supplicant all the time, then no one can say no. And having a little bit of money in your pocket from one of these sideline gigs allows you the freedom to say no. And, and to me, that's the most important thing because uh, I don't want to be a supplicant. I have too much pride. I'm, I, have, I, am, I have experience, I have value, and I want people to see that and recognize that. And if they don't, I want to be able to say, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, see you later. And I think it's only by a lot of us uh, saying, okay, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, is, is there going to be change? And I think we're seeing this on the crew level right now, where basically people who are experienced are just not taking work under a certain cutoff level. And it's, maybe creeping into the mentality of designers, but more slowly, because I think that uh, in the world of electricians and carpenters, there's much more of a, even if they're not in the union, like an organized labor mentality. And, and I, I think that's good. I think in designers, that has been very slow to take root. And I think you see it in older designers, I think you see it in, in, in people when they get to their 40s and their 50s and they start thinking about 
okay, am I going to keep doing 24 regional shows a year for $4,000? And it, that's going to be my life until I have a fucking heart attack and I die. Like what on earth does the future hold? And um, yeah, I, that's not the future I want for myself. And I think it's not the future most of us want for ourselves. And I, I think only by having the tiniest bit of financial freedom are we ever going to be able to say no. So that's why I think this is important. It is empowering to say no, or it, it, I think it's even beyond saying no. It's, this is so cliche and like corny, but saying yes to yourself, you know, choosing yourself over all of the other stuff Absolutely. for other people in every way, you know, no, I'm not going to do that job because I want to go to my best friend's wedding, you know, or just like little things like that, where I've definitely missed really big life events yeah. from performing. And I, and I will perform in that show. And I would think like, I want to be at my best friend's wedding. And I literally cannot say no. So every time that you do or say yes to yourself, it's just it like, really, oh. <laughs> it's it nice. hurts your soul to do that it's and i did it too i think we've all done it i've missed very important events of friends and relatives and it just i am so sad for myself of back then that i did that it was so the wrong choice and you don't think you have a choice until you do and you know and i love theater i'm from theater i grew up doing theater i've been doing theater since i was a little little boy and I started running lights when I was 10 years old. And all I wanted to do was do theater. And it's still, if I had a choice, it would be all I would do. But um, it's just not the reality. And if, if it's not going to change, I want institutional theaters and I want the major graduate programs to come out and say, a middle-class living is impossible. And having children is impossible. I want them to admit it. And no one will admit it. And I think that they bear a, a heavy responsibility. I think the graduate programs mm -hmm. bear a heavy responsibility for not saying to people, you probably have to find another skill set if you're going to pay your bills. And I remember Ming saying on the yeah. first day of set design class, oh, well, I had family money. If you don't have family money, I don't know how you do. And I'm like, you're telling me this now? I just took out all these fucking loans. Are you kidding me? And, you know, the, the difference between having a 20 hour a week work study job and not having a 20 hour a week work study job, like all of these things, it, it doesn't hit you until you're a little bit into it that, oh my God, I really have signed up for something that nobody told me about and you keep learning about it even well after grad school it keeps hitting you in these little ways and uh um yeah i so. i mean i remember i i went to school as an actor and i remember them telling us or or me finding out that um it's something like 0.01 percent of the membership of equity makes their living fully off acting like yeah. <laughs> i mean insane like that and i was like oh Maybe this is not what I want to do. And yeah. it's, it's certainly more feasible to make a living full time off of design, especially if you are like, I'm an associate. So I, I yeah. work off Broadway shows and they pay me a lot more. So if I do a couple of those a year, I'm okay. But yeah. that doesn't leave me a lot of space to have a life. And that's the part I didn't know. Yeah. It makes me think of your question before, uh, like, when do you go all in? How do you split your time up? Because that is a luxury at the end of the day. Makes me think of work study because I was in work study and I was in, you know, like a mm -hmm. conservatory style program. But I've, I've, you know, figured out how to do that. And I think that just, um, I carried that through in my adult life, but it just, it's unfair at the end of the day because these people have so much more time and they're able to invest it in one thing if they choose. I think this is kind of my way of reclaiming that. It's like, well, if I have to do multiple things, then I'm going to do things that I really enjoy. I think once I yeah. really dove deep into them, I realized how much I love it. I love kids theater after doing it. At, like that was a discovery for me. I did it at first to pay my bills, you know, and then one thing kind of led to another. And I feel the same way about having my own company 
how is it hard in like literally every way, but I anticipated that. And I think it's just me re literally reclaiming all of that. I can do the things that I love to do in my own way. Yeah. Um, do you, one of the things I wanted to just uh, touch on and uh, um, was just, are you, are there shows and theater work that you feel like you have been able to um, still engage with as you, I mean, Kate, you're, you're doing associate work. Um, uh, I know Lauren, you're, you, you haven't, you said you haven't been in a tech in a, in a very long time. Um, I, I, I'm curious because you know we, uh, as we've all said, you know we kind of. I, I don't think the goal is to is to uh, <laughs> support uh, theaters hiring people for not enough money by doing other work outside of the theater, right? So, um, and and I think that we can all be well served by. Uh, I think one of the things that I've learned is also just to, even if I have another job and even if I am supporting myself in other ways, um, continue to ask for the money because. Uh, you can't you can't just take jobs for free even if even if you have another job um, and um, and I think um, I, I one of the things I'm wondering just is is are there any um, uh, what, what have you missed in the theater and how have you been able to engage with it uh, and uh, and keep active in it um, I know Stowe you've been a wing space member um, and that's that's one way, at least for me, that was a very positive way of kind of just staying involved with theater. Um, and just to talk about that and like what, you know, if you could do a show, one show a year, what would it be um, in that dream job? Like what, how would you, how would you pick that show? <laughs> I mean, for me, I, I got to do something which I which I probably wouldn't have had the space and time to do, um, chasing a full time sound design career, which was that that about eighteen months ago, um, with a dramaturg friend Sarah Lunny and and Yuvika Talani, a producer, I made a um, uh, a theater project experience for an automated telephone system uh, that was commissioned by Wooly Mammoth, and then went to the Rep of St. Louis, um, and was the kind of genesis of a project that I did with Sarah 10 years earlier when we were both on staff at Actors Theatre of Louisville, which is the sort of thing you do when you're an intern in Louisville and you're happy to, you know, sit up until two in the morning dreaming about telephone ideas and then you get a full time job and you have a little bit more creative brain space and you're finally able to come back around to this idea again and say, hey, we could we now with more technology and more expertise we could actually do this thing on a much bigger level. Um, so that's the like that's the sort of opportunity that keeps me in touch, but is is quite different than what I would do if I was just gigging as a as a sound designer. Um, like I don't think there would be that space. I'm not sure uh, how it would look to kind of break out of the designer mold and into the generative artist mold. Um, like that that I necessarily would have been able to make that leap. Um, and I certainly just think I wouldn't have had the time or the or the creative brain space to do it. Um, I think for me, so much because I've only ever really dramaturged within an institution, um, that there's something, and you know, you're just getting assigned to things. Like you have some sort of agency over what you choose, but you know, it is very much sometimes it feels like an exercise in forced collaboration. Um, and I think for me, the thing that I'm most interested in doing is having it really be like an active choice to be a part of a process and not just part of like my regular job and not just like, well, we're producing doubt and someone needs to dramaturg it. Guess it's you, you, you know, <laughs> um, but really having a like agency over the projects that I pick and the people that I work with and not just going into it and hoping like, hey, let's all figure out how we can be useful to each other. Um, that's not an experience that I've ever had. Um, and that's actually something that I'm really like, if I could do one project a year, that's something that just I pick and it's with people that I have a sort of like existing artistic shorthand with or just like a general excitement about working with. Um, that is something that I would like work for whatever and make all the space and time for. Yeah, Janelle. So um, with like all the shows that I've done in my life, I've only been a part of one show that was predominantly black or everyone was black. The entire cast was black. The entire creative team was black. The only person who was not black was our uh, stage director. Our stage director, he was Asian. And um, 
so I love the play initially. And then I remember going into the space thinking like, oh, this will be a really great experience because I haven't had it. And it was just so transformative in every single way. I really felt seen. I really felt heard um, and comfortable with everyone from the beginning. The way that people listen to me is different. And I also, I, you know, I went to, my college was mostly white. All of the schools that I had gone to before were private and mostly white. So that was really my only time like ever being in a, in a space fully with, with people of color. So I think I know that if I could be a part of another project, it would be something like that where I could create a space where people like me felt comfortable and were and felt free to just create without all of the extra stuff. Um, I was gonna just also, I mean, one of the things that I think is um, uh, interesting is, you know, there's there's so much uh, history of, of artists having either backgrounds, you know, Wallace Stevens being an insurance executive and, uh, and, and things like that. I'm wondering, what other, if you've ever heard, when I was, when I first started out of graduate school and, and out of college, I had several friends who were um, bookkeeping um, as a, as a way to support their dance careers and their sound design careers. Um, and it always struck me, I mean, I, I, I never learned QuickBooks uh, and I wasn't, and it was, it was, but it always struck me as, oh, that's kind of interesting. You can, especially now you can do it remotely. Um, uh, and you could probably, you know, you can make pretty decent money on your own schedule. You could probably do it in a hotel room while you're in tech. Um, are there other things that, uh, we could recommend and what would we recommend about the things that we are doing for other people kind of, uh, jumping into, uh, kind of, or, or, or jumping away from theater or jumping adjacent to theater? Um, I, you know, cause I, I feel like there are more things, the, the, the bookkeeping thing just always, always struck me. And I always wondered why that wasn't a, a more regular thing. I think it requires a certain uh, detail oriented, meticulous nature, which I think designers have because a lot of what we do is organization. I mean, I'm not a bookkeeper, but it just seems like you have to really have attention to detail. So uh, I think that some of the things I do are like that, not bookkeeping, but they require attention to detail and uh, uh, an ability to break down a lot of information and organize it. Um, I, I think that anything you're going to do that's theater adjacent, uh, you know, where you're going to earn more money is in things that uh, intersect with a world that's not about performing because consulting intersects and is largely within the world of construction and building. And the whole way people think about money there is just tremendously different. And the arts organization intersects with that world because they have to engage it to get a building built. There's no other way. And people who consult in that world sit in a pay structure that's kind of halfway between. You're not getting as much as the architects or the contractors, but you're certainly getting more than theater people. And, you know, an event it, for me intersect with, they just intersect with rich people. And, uh, you know, they think about money completely differently. Um, and you get used to saying numbers. And this gets to this whole thing that uh, we've been talking about, about sharing information. And I think that uh, not being secretive about this and sharing information about what people get paid uh, is revolutionary. I was on a conversation on the A29 Facebook group and we were talking about electrician rates and a costume designer happened to pop into the thread and said, Are you, you're talking about non-union electricians? Like this is what they get paid? And we said, yeah, that's, they get paid like 30 or 35 bucks an hour at minimum. And she said, oh my God, stitchers, costume assistants, like everybody in my world gets paid, you know, far less than that. And I said, well, I didn't know that we're sharing this information now. So now take that information and say to your production managers, why the hell are the people working for the costume department getting paid half of what the people in the electrics department are working for? 
And when I started doing events, I have an old, old friend that I used to do dance with, uh, you know, we used to light dance pieces and she is completely in the event world now. And I had to make a quote for my services for this thing. that was going to take like four days. And I wrote to her and I said, Donnelly, what do people make? And she sent me two different quotes from other designers. And she wasn't supposed to do that, but you know, I also think, why wouldn't we share that information? And I was shocked. It was like, these people are charging more than $1,500 a day and no one bats an eye. They get it immediately, you know, or a flat fee for a two or three day thing of like $20,000. Like it's crazy. But the people that are paying the bill are like, well, I pay my lawyer that every week. And so why not? Like those numbers deeply bother us on some level, but they don't bother this whole other class of people at all one bit. And it doesn't mean that they're not going to try to push back on it, but you're at least starting from this point of view of, yeah, I am taking up space and I'm saying this is my number and let them push back on it. But they're not going to push you all the way back to, you know, $1,800 for a three-week show with no pension and welfare. So anyway. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I answered your question at all. (laughs) Uh, I've heard about people doing medical transcription. Um, I don't know how much that really exists anymore. I know there's a lot of softwares out there that doctors use and it sort of does it automatically and someone checks it. But um, for me, coming from the projection design background, you know, photo editing, video editing, and 3D modeling are all outside of the theater, very high paid skills, <laughs> it turns out. Um, so, you know, I luckily, one of the things that happened during the pandemic is people started doing all these virtual events and they quickly realized that just a bunch of heads in a box wasn't gonna be enough for their like four day conference that they usually do in Cleveland and they were trying to do over Zoom. They needed some sort of production value. So they would start to shoot things and then they needed editors and they needed somebody to do little motion graphics to make it more interesting. And I can charge them $55, $60 an hour and be like, yeah, that took me all day and it took me an hour (laughs) because they expect that it took me all day and there was a minimum rate. And like that has been a lifesaver during the pandemic. And, And it's one of the things that we don't advertise as like, you know, headline on our website, but we do a lot of that work at Remarkable Squirrel. And um, we've gotten a couple connections to people who do those, produce those sort of live events and it's been a great money stream. And I will say sort of circling back to our previous conversation about valuing yourself, like knowing that I can charge somebody 55, 60, $70 an hour for what I do makes it that much easier to say no to the show that wants me to do an entire week of tech for $300. Yeah. I think yeah. it's all about. And it gives me the freedom to, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, and it gives me the freedom to like take vacations. You know, I took off, I could be working. I could be working for Peter. Who's uh, Peter Negrini is the person I associate for the most. And he's designing the Hans Zimmer world tour or European tour right now. And instead of really working on that this month, I went to my brother's wedding and I went snowboarding and I'm taking a vacation. (laughs) Like, and I have the freedom to do that. Like a normal person. Yeah. And now I have to surgery, but that's a whole different thing. (laughs) Uh That's the cost of having a life you get. Yes. Luckily with an I have enough union jobs that I have insurance, which is the flip side of being a freelancer. This, yeah, this is the other thing, because I still depend on USA for my insurance, and uh, so I, I have to still take theater projects, but I have to be choosy. It's a real weird quandary that I'm in, because I can't take a two-week project for $2,000, like, it does, even if there's pension and welfare, it doesn't make any sense, and so... Um, that, that's actually the, the next thing I wanted to talk about, because, uh, you know, kind I, of all Janelle these... was going to say something. Oh, I'm sorry, Janelle. Um, what was I going to say? I guess, well, so the, what you picked up, Kate, is I think that is what I keep hearing is, um, 
how many times can you say yes to yourself and know what you're worth and like really demand it? Cause you're right. If you know what you're worth, they will pay you for whatever you, whatever you need, whatever you tell them you are worth, like you determine that, not them. But I think we've all just been a part of this system and you learn that things are one way and <clears throat> maybe it's the pandemic that kind of made everybody think about their, their choices and um, how can things change? What are the things that we don't like? So it might just be a collective shift that we're all going through, but it's an empowering one. And I mean, there's also, if you're talking about side hustles or like other hustles, there's always kids theater. I find that if there's anything that will never go away, it's the need for people who need their kids to be watched <laughs> or for you, you know, for you to teach them. And that was my saving grace actually during the pandemic. I got a ton of nannying work and that stuff is also, you can negotiate things with that. I've had, um, I've done private nannying where I've negotiated um, healthcare as well and things like that. And it really depends family to family. And, you know, if you let them know, like I'm a performer, I'm a this, I'm a that, if I need to do this thing, then I'm choosing that over your child. Say it nicely. It's, 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 <laughs> it's funny you say that because as a parent, uh, I've been on the other side of that. And it's really great to be able to support somebody um, one of the things that I discovered very quickly was you need a bench. You've got to have three, two or three nannies. Cause when somebody gets a tour and they go out and they're gone for three weeks, you're in, you're up a Creek. So you need to have like this kind of, you need to work it out. So you could have some kind of a bench and, and, and when they get a, when they get a gig, you can kind of slot them in. There's even, I believe, uh, there is a, a nanny service in New York, uh, create, creative, I forget the name of it, started by a former uh, Lincoln Center Festival uh, marketing person. She's actually, I, I think I know her from, from, from my kid's school, that is all geared around performers and actors uh, nannying uh, in their free time. Um, I never used it because they seem to take an exorbitant percentage of, of everything dollar that I would be paying somebody. And I happen to know enough people, but it seemed to be working um, for some people. So you were about to say something, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna, to Aaron's point about, you know, what, what non-union electricians make, like that was my strategy coming up. It was just to, to if I couldn't fill my weeks, it was to go work at the public or go work at, at Playwrights Horizons mm -hmm. and hang speakers and things. And, and that was super valuable and also a great way to learn some new things and to meet some new people and all those sorts of things. So I do hear what Aaron said earlier about, it's not the creative outlet that you might want, but to me, that was a lifesaver in my first five years in New York, just to be able to fill in the gaps between things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. My, my first year or two here, I worked for, I was a freelance. I, one of the things I did was freelance uh, AV for an event company called Frost Productions. Yeah. And like, you know, it was 20, 35, $25 an hour, not nothing amazing, like putting up, you know, people's $2 million bought, bought mitzvahs, but <laughs> it paid the bills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The event world is, it's challenging. We know. We know Frost. They're, I mean, they're not a competitor. They're huge, but uh, you know, the, there's the the skills are almost identical, and this is where it it's one of the easiest pivots, I think, because I mean, literally, you are just doing shows. You are mixing or you're lighting or you you are doing exactly what you're doing somewhere else, and <clears throat> the trade off is just deciding if it's worth it, if it's going to kill your soul or not. For me, um, what kills my soul is not seeing my kids. Right. And that was actually, Aaron, I'm going to cut you off there a little bit because I, that's one of the things that I've always, my perception of, of kind of events and things like that is that, is that actually the compromises that I was, that I was getting frustrated with, with theater, with, you know, leaving for such long chunks of time and the long hours, I would not get relief from that from the events world. I would have the paycheck at least for that time. But... Uh, well, I think the idea is that you don't do that every day, right? Because events are short. Right. So, um, you know, we're in a different situation. We're business owners. So we are taking a bigger chunk of the pie than the people that work for us. But, you know, we try to pay people very, very well. And we try to be 
up at the top of the pay scale for individual positions. And, you know, in this labor market, it's the only way you get people to work for you. Um, but, you know, you can do an event or two a week and still, still make what you need to make. I mean, none of us are trying to get rich. It's not our goal to get rich. It's our goal to be a little safer and it's our goal, our goal to be a little saner and to be home more and not to be working late at night all the time. I mean, and if I'm honest with myself, if I think about many of the theatrical productions that I've done, uh, you know, frequently designers are not treated all that well and their input is not that valued. And it certainly happened to me where it's like the director just wants to tell you what to do the whole time and you sit there for, you know, 10 days making the cues the director wants you to make and you stop fighting after two or three days and you're just like okay this is what we're doing and all right oh you're asking me what level that is oh well it's at 30 and they say how about 25 and you go okay how about 25 and would you like no, the magic I don't sheet? <clears throat> what would you like the magic sheet <laughs> yeah right i've had directors ask me what my front light color is it's like do you really want to have this conversation and that's not, you know, that's not every show, but certainly when that happens, you're like, wow, I'm doing something where I have no agency and I'm doing it for like $1,500. And so I would rather have no agency somewhere else. And, but you asked earlier, Adrian, what, what would be the ideal situation? What would be, if money were no object, what I would do? I would be, you know, in like the back it lighting a straight play uh, with a small room with a handful of people that really like each other, shooting ideas across the table at each other, and uh, you know, with trusted collaborators, that would be my ideal. But uh, you know, it just happens so rarely. And you know, you do a show for an off-Broadway company in the Beckett, and they're paying you a thousand dollars, and they can't even af afford to put P and W on top of it, so they're paying you like you know, $790 because they couldn't afford the $210 that your thousand dollar fee was going to make them pay in P&W. So it's like, I mean, you can only do that so much. Um, Adrian, to your, to your question about the bargain, which, you know, and, and doing events work and, and what do you get back? You know, I'll just say from, from my chair, and this is the thing I thought about a lot today in preparation for this, there are a ton of things that I miss socially and creatively about uh, being a freelance theater designer and working on shows and, and collaborating, but there's almost, there's nothing I miss about the business of being a theater designer. And at some point that was what made the bargain really clear is that th there was, there was nothing on the business side. It was, it was less money. It was less stability. It was more hustling. It was longer hours. It was worse, uh, uh, uh benefits. It was, you know, it was having to pay my own um, self-employment tax. It was having to maintain my own equipment. It was having to uh, have my own office space, all those sort of things. Like it just, when I looked at the stack of business things, it became very clear. And in some ways that made the bargain easier to swallow. Again, I have a job where I do get to still do creative work, but I think I could be working in a much less creative place and still have have made that bargain and so that that was a useful rubric for me to look at the look mm -hmm. at the whole thing and say there's kind of nothing on this side of the ledger that's better if i stay and there's a lot of things that are better over here but i can i can make my peace with the ways in which it's gonna you know those things aren't gonna be as fulfilling i'm not gonna be in rooms with all of my friends making something creative um but I mean, I can all this other stuff i hope we're not being too discouraging i i know looking at the participants there's at least one a uh, young person on here who's a recent graduate and you know we'll in in eight minutes when we go to q a i'm going to put her on the spot because i want to hear if we're uh making her just not ever want to do theater and god i love theater i don't want to do that to somebody but i think i just want people to know going in what it's like and how you can still allow yourself to do it and you know, hedge against some of the worst uh, abuses in pay. So Gabby, if you're out there listening, we are going to put you on the spot in eight minutes. I think yeah. that's, I think it's a I think that's a good point. Because yeah, Kate, go ahead. Well, I had one more pivot to add to the sort of side hustle to add to the list, which is associate work. 
because we haven't really talked about it. And that that's sort of my big side hustle. And and like I said, I, I work for Peter Negrini a lot. I have a stable of other designers that I work for as well. And I'm coming out of grad school. I never thought I wanted to be an assistant or associate. Like I thought that I wanted to be the voice in the room and I wanted to be, I didn't really want to answer to somebody else, but it turns out I still get to make content and I still get to be creative, like with, with the designers that I work with because they value me and my voice and I, I enjoy being in the room with them. I still get to do a lot of the work that I really enjoy, but I actually don't have to deal with the politics of like talking to the director and making sure they're happy. And, you know, I, I often don't even have to negotiate my own contracts and mm. it's kind of really great. Like it's a, it's a relief. And I also, there's also like a, a, a wave to it. You know, I'm not being a production designer instead of a lighting designer, which is one of the reasons I wanted to do it. Um, there's downtime between projects where I'm still getting paid to edit and create the next thing um, as an associate, you know, I get, I get paid to make content. So even when I'm not in tech, I'm getting paid a lot of times a similar rate. And that's sort of the, the trade-off is like, you know, when you break it down hourly, the rate is not great when we're in tech, but because I get a similar rate during prep when I'm working hopefully less hours that kind of helps to balance it out. So, you know, being an associate and assistant. Are you able to get up above scale? Uh, I am now, but yeah. I, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. But I've only been doing this Beetlejuice coming back to Broadway will be only be my third Broadway show. So um, I'm, I'm relatively new to New York. I've only been here uh, I graduated in 2017, so five, four and a half years, and two of those are pandemic years. So, um, I, I am a young upstart, <laughs> even though I'm older. Yeah, I, I will also say, you know, Aaron, to just to uh, thank you for yeah making sure this uh, stays positive because I think that the associate work is uh, a, you know a real a real thing. Um, uh, several web members of Wing Space have talked recently about how you know, the film and TV world is so active in, in, in New York um, that mm -hmm. they so active that they could come and draft on a, on a show for a few days a week. Even they were in, normally I would, you know, normally you hear, you know, film, film crews want you there, you know, six days a week, but they were so desperate. They, they needed, they, people would come in for three or four days or five days. Um, that's something. And then, uh, and then, yeah. And I've, I've known people who, uh, who've, who've spent careers doing associate work, um, staying in the business, um, and, uh, and, you know, they're dealing with the travel, um, and dealing with the, the hours, the 10 out of 12s, but, um, but you still get to be in the world. Lauren, you were about to see me? Oh, no, sorry, sorry. I'm, <laughs> um, I'm curious about Edward's question. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll read it off. Something uh, Edward posts, something I'm curious about. Designers can reach out to USA 829, our union, to find out about wage calculate, uh, wage scales. Um, do actors and dramaturgs have anything similar? Um, I, just from the dramaturg's perspective, because we don't have a union, but LMDA does publish um, like resources about sort of like suggested standard rates for different projects. Mm -hmm. um, I normally just ask my friends who are dramaturgs whenever I need something and whenever I'm negotiating something. Um, Cause mine are, some of the projects I've been working on are just like a little, like they work in like different ways. Like it's not just like a straight show. It's like, I've been working on things that are like a little bit more long-term um, but that's generally how it goes. Like, I mean, the sort of like world of dramaturgical pay is also like in general, like the market value for dramaturgs is a problem. Um, so when you, cause the field rate is so low overall that you're just constantly going to be undervalued because the position like the sprawl of responsibilities is so different from job to job that like theaters just use that as an excuse to like pay people the absolute bare minimum um so i mean i think that in terms of rates also just like a lot of theaters don't hire like freelance dramaturgs on a basis because they're normally using a staff dramaturg who doesn't get an additional compensation for whatever shows that they're working on um so it's like i feel like also like a lot of theaters just don't even have like a sort of standard freelance rate but lmda does offer guidelines and suggestions and like resources for that which i think is very helpful for early career 
dramaturgs. I do the same as Lauren, actually. I just ask, and I make that a practice with every job that I have or any space. I just literally ask and I, I make it known how much I get paid. And it always starts the conversation. I think but there's such a patrician history in theater and, you know, money is just something you don't talk about. And that's, it, it, it holds so many people back. We need to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Janelle, I didn't mean to cut you off. I don't know if you were done. Oh, no, you're good, Aaron. Well, I think, I guess, I feel like NPR told me the other day that um, there's something, maybe a bill that's about to be passed about transparency with pay with every job that if you, um, let's say you're looking for an employee to work for you, you have to say the top amount and the bottom amount of how much has been offered in the past. So I think that'll help things. It's the state of New York is doing that. That's, yeah. Yep. I also think that people don't realize, like, especially people who work in theaters full time, that it's perfectly legal to talk about your salary with other people, um, that like it is actually illegal for your employer to encourage you not to do that. Um, and I think that that's also, you know, I'm starting to see like more salary transparency. And I mean, I've always said that, like, I think the only reason why theaters don't post salaries is because either they're too low and they know it or they want to encourage like low ball offers from like people who are like conditioned to devalue their own labor. Um, that it's just like, they're just looking to save money in the end. I really don't think that there's any other <laughs> legitimate reason for not doing it. Um, and most of the boards won't accept ads anymore that don't list salary, which is a good thing. Because if they can't post on the boards, they're not gonna get people. So it kind of forces people yeah. to. And if the theater is a nonprofit, they have to file how much all the top line people are making. Like it's public information. So you can look yeah. and see them. Have you yeah, ever and I mean, I, and I think it's just like, it's so like the discrepancy too between like executive compensation and then what your lower oh. level people are making is it also just sort of really lays the institutional priorities bare because you can see like, what are the actual jobs and what are the labor that you value and how are you, so, and how are you compensating that? It's well, really you're, good. You're, we're a small theater. We can only pay you $36,000, but the artistic director makes $3 million a year. Excuse me. <sighs> yeah. The Form 990s are well worth a look for any nonprofit you're going to work for. It's kind of amazing. Can I Edward have joined us? Welcome, Edward. Hi. Um, uh, well, uh, I'm going to read some announcements, just wing space announcements, because we're about we're 90 minutes in and it seemed like there was a good thing. But I just wanted to say if I could amplify in like every salon we do, like ask people what they're getting paid, like just normalize talking to your friends. Like if you aren't in the union, you're a designer, just ask any of your friends who are in the USA. We can make a simple call, phone call to Caitlin and ask you and we can tell you exactly what they're paying all of the design categories at the theater that you're going to. So. Um, I just want to amplify that to everyone, just not to don't be self-conscious and to tell people what, are you, what you're being paid and to ask them. Um, we want to give our panelists, uh, who we pay out of our own pockets, the opportunity to leave here at 90 minutes and be respectful of their time, if they'd like. Uh, upcoming salons can be seen at wingspace.com slash events. We'll put this in the chat. Uh, and at uh, our Facebook, which is facebook.com slash wingspace TD for theatrical design. Um, we'll also be putting in a PayPal in the chat if you'd like to contribute uh, to this in our future salons. Um, we do offer to pay our panelists for their time here. Um, you can also jo join our email list at the bottom of any page at wingspace.com, which we'll be, we will put in the chat. Um, and also, I wanted to say that Aaron Kopp, I'm sorry if Adrian already said this, but Aaron Kopp actually inspired the salon by running to us at salons at wingspace.com, uh, encouraging us to uh, talk about and demystify um, uh, what it's like to seek out uh, and find a sideline or a, a full time. Uh, so thank you very much, Aaron, for uh, inspiring the salon and getting folks to talk about this. Um, Wingspace has a mentorship program. Uh, I don't know if applications are currently live, but this is about the time of year that we start to do that. So uh, we'll put a link to our mentorship page if you know any um, uh, younger folks uh, interested in uh, theater directing dramaturgy, please let us know. Uh, sorry. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. 
Kate Ducey is a former mentee, um, uh, though very much a peer uh, to us. But uh, yes, she went through the mentorship program when she was brand new to New York. Um, We'll stop the recording soon so you can all start uh, swearing like sailors. Um, and we'll keep uh, the Zoom going for a little bit while if people want to keep on talking. Um, I just want to thank uh, Adrian Jones for mentoring the conversation. Uh, the Salon Committee people, Christine Mock, myself, Kate Fury, Adrian Jones, Kate Pitt, uh, Tanya Arlana, uh, Rodrigo Hernandez Martinez, E.L. Hone, Anna Driftmeyer. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you, everybody, and Edward, for, for doing all the, the legwork, um, uh, getting this going, and Aaron. Um, yeah, I, uh, and, and thank you, panelists. This has been a really great, uh, great conversation um, with all of you. I have, I have some questions, but I wanted to, um, yeah, we can, we can all turn on our, have, you, have we stopped the, 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 the feed. Um, but if anybody has a question, you can turn on your camera and say hi. Um, and we can also just facilitate some more questions. Um, uh, we have not stopped streaming, just in case anyone on the Facebook live chat wants oh, to uh, contribute questions as well. Um, so we'll stop streaming when the Q&A wraps up uh, and we'll end the recording then too. One. One of the things that I was just well, well, pe people have questions. I, you know, one of the things I was noting, and I think it's important to note, is that you know, there's the stability that we have with theater. We all all these contracts are often written for us by either a union or things like that, and uh, and we have, like Aaron was mentioning, we have healthcare often through our unions and things like that. And then once you start to break out, Kate, you're clearly you know in this boat. You've got a company. Um, Janelle, if, if, if your pepper sauce goes crazy, you've got to, you know, you've got to, you know, make a company and, and do all those things. <clears throat> and then there's, you know, and, and it's interesting because there's all those, uh, it's tricky, right? We have to figure out how to, um, balance. Cause you could be in another boat where you're, where you're hustling all over again. Um, and, uh, and part of me says, oh, you know, cause we're some, some of us are just starting whole businesses and that's, not so much a side hustle, but it turns into a full a full on pivot um, if you really dig into it. Um, and then there's the then there's the it's not really a question. I'm just musing really. Um, and then there you know and then the nine to five uh, the the more regular you know five day work week um, seems like a much more civilized world uh, in the long run. Um, but uh, but yeah, and I I'm also curious, Lauren, to just I, I want to curious about uh, how it was kind of getting on. Substack and how it was starting a newsletter and how you're getting your your subscribers and and things like that. How did how did it get going? Um, it Substack was super easy to use and that was part of the reason why I opted for the platform. Um, and I really like I I have not had any sort of brand master plan <laughs> as far as as far as it has gone. It has really I haven't done any sort of advertising. It's really been like very much a word of mouth thing, which is why I've been so surprised by the amount of people that have responded to it. I do love that whenever I write about a specific theater, I can tell when it's being forwarded around the office because all of a sudden I'll get like 10 signups with like emails from that theater's like from there, which is great. I love that. Um, so it really has been very much something that has just sort of like shared. Um, Substack also makes it very easy to switch into offering um, paid subscriptions. When I first started it, I had my Venmo and my PayPal because I was unemployed and I didn't want it to, I didn't want to, whatever I generated from it, I didn't want it to show up as my formal income. Um, but then once I actually got a regular full-time job, I switched about a year over to actually doing it through Substack, which does it through Stripe um, and actually like takes all of the backend work out of it. I do have to give them 10% of any sort of revenue that I generate from it, but that covers all of the credit card fees and everything. So it actually is something that is like very hands-off for me, which is great because I didn't want to deal with it. Um, so in terms of platform, that's been super easy. And I chose it just because I know a lot of journalists who have done the same thing. Um, but, and you know, when I say like in my intro, it's always like, when I say it's like the number one theater newsletter, I feel like that's kind of like saying when you're like the number one Amazon bestseller in like some really obscure category, like, you know, memoirs about like basket weaving or something. Um, like, like, you know, there's not a ton of theater publications on there, but, um, you know, but it is something that's growing beyond just like, I feel like it started as a platform for independent journalists and writers in general. And I feel like it's growing to like also 
incorporate a lot of different culture writers as well. So can I ask about Substack? Is there basically you can browse Substack and just pick and choose, or is there a subscription fee for Substack as a general thing or subscriptions no. are for each author? No. So you do have to subscribe to each author. And then like on the Substack page, you can have like a reader. It's kind of like Google reader RIP. Um, but pretty much like all, if you subscribe to any anything on Substack, it comes to your email or you can read it on the sort of website either or. Um, I would say that for my views, like I have 3,400 subscribers right now, but if you count in like website views, like each edition of the newsletter probably reaches about like six to 7,000 people mm -hmm. um, because I'll link to it on, you know, various <laughs> other platforms and people will come to it direct from that. I, I have a question for the rest of the panel. Uh, what, how do you, do you have any tricks uh, for framing your theater experience to people who are outside the theater when you're trying to get jobs. I mean, Lauren, I'm specifically interested for you because you went so to such a straight job that has no concept of what institutional dramaturgy is. But I think probably all of us have little tips and tricks for how you frame your resume to somebody who doesn't know how to look at it. Yeah, I mean, I just really, just because I was applying for jobs that had nothing to do with theater at all. And I also feel like so much of being a dramaturg is, is explaining to people what you do constantly, even people in theater. Um, so for me, it's just like, I just had to like think about specific projects and then like finding like very neutral corporate terms for them. Everybody loves talking about project management. Um, you know, like I, I honestly feel like 75% of institutional dramaturgy is writing very clear, bullet pointed, persuasive, friendly emails. Um, that is actually like a very useful skill that everybody wants you to have in terms of like your writing and communication style, talking a lot about like sort of like, I don't know, like cross departmental collaboration, you know, like that is also just like how to like speak specifically about like your collaborative skills. But for me, it was pretty much like project management and collaboration and then just never using the word theater or dramaturg ever at all. <laughs> hmm. I mean, I'll say, my, my, the project management definitely resonates with me. The idea that like you, I made 20 things this year and they all came in more or less on time and more or less on budget was a very like clear thing to be able to say to somebody. Um, and then just talking about deadlines too, like just talking about that, that thing of, of working under pressure is a thing that we all, whether you're an electrician or a scenic carpenter or a, a designer or an actor, we all know what that end of game pressure is and that's a thing that like is we think is very normal and the world thinks is very rare i think yeah i also think that one of the challenging things was also thinking about like metrics for my accomplishment for my accomplishments when i was talking about in interviews or like on my resume so it's like how can i actually say like talk about the reach of certain projects that i worked on or of like programming or et cetera, and actually figuring out how to talk about that in a quantifiable way i actually found like very difficult and i had to spend a lot of time thinking about how to like frame certain responsibilities that i had so that they weren't just sort of like state like here's a thing i did but it but thinking about it more like impact wise which was just like i feel like in you're not necessarily that's not necessarily how my brain works when i think about my creative work when i think about creative work in that way um, so redefining metrics in general, I also spent most of my time when I was applying for jobs doing that. For me, I work in such a different field, you know, it's way more tied to theater. So theater is a strength. So the more I can incorporate that when talking about what I do, the better. But um, I feel like across the board, people are always interested in how I get along with other people and how I work with other people, just collaborative skills in general. Like what can you bring and then how can you mesh it with other ideas to create the thing? So I always kind of hold on to that. Yeah, yeah I, I think, I, oh, I was gonna say, I just think knowing that like, I can say that I know how to work with like a variety of different personalities. Like when I started my current job at the engineering company, I was like, you know, told that like, oh, there are some difficult people. And then I dealt with them. I'm like, this is not a difficult person. <laughs> like, like, this is not a high maintenance individual. This is perfect. Like, this is the one of the easiest conversations I've ever had. So I also feel like our sort of like capacity for like difficulty um, is also like a huge strength and a huge skill and something that I always try to play up to. It's interesting because it, it, it relates to the pivot uh, and the sideline question, because one of the things that 
comes up often when I'm in meetings is people I'm working with will ask me what show I'm working on. And, uh, and they want to hear about the show. Uh, and it's a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a plus that I don't just do this. And, and, um, and so I wonder, you know, it's one of the things I've often wondered is, is there a way, you know, like, is there a way to keep those projects going, at, you know, just both for me creatively, um, can I find the balance and I don't know if I'll be able to, but can I find the balance to keep those couple of shows a year, one or two shows a year, I'm doing one dance piece this year. I'm very excited to do it. Uh, you know, it, it's, you know, but, um, and I can tell them about that, but I don't have another, I don't have another Broadway show in the pipe. You know, so it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I've certainly structured my resume in the past to just include like a couple of shows and my position and really a lot of description about what I do with all of the fun corporate buzzwords that everyone's already been saying, you know, project management, um, detail oriented, meets budgets, high prep, you know, work, used to working in a high stakes environment, collaborating cross departmentally, anticipating needs is one that I usually put on there. Mm -hmm. um, and also I, I have in the past put on, like when I was a production office coordinator and I wanted to pivot to something else, I would put on there that like, I manage budgets for $3 million an episode show, TV show. Like people, people seem to be impressed by that. You know, any sort of thing you can think about to, to make it more, I don't know, set, just sound better. But we all are used to, you know, as a designer, you, you manage the budget for your department. You break down how much labor you need. You figure out your hours, even if it's only you doing it you should still be doing those things, right? Breaking down like, okay, they've paid me this much. This is how many hours I'm spending in the room. How many hours can I spend actually building this show? And we don't always want to have those conversations with ourselves, but we should be doing it. 